Ruiz. Welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm. This is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I am your host, Scott Dr. GX Wolfi. If you enjoy this programming, subscribe to the Funkin' Stuff channel on YouTube, which is where Truth and Rhythm lives, and be an advocate by spreading the word among fellow funk, jazz, and R&B music lovers. Join Truth and Rhythm's membership program through Patreon. You can also submit a direct donation to the cause anytime at funkandstuff.net. At that site, you can also purchase the book, Everything's on the One, The First Guide of Funk. Shop for official Truth and Rhythm and Funk and Stuff merchandise and use the Amazon links for all of your online purchases, which allocates a percentage to this show. For those of you who go the extra step in supporting the show, you have my heartfelt gratitude for allowing us to continue to shine the light on those special artists whose quest is to find truth in rhythm. I'm delighted to welcome to the Truth and Rhythm Mothership, Cheryl James, a former road manager and background singer beginning in the 1970s within the Parliament Funkadelic Organization. Cheryl, thank you so much for joining me. How are you today? I'm wonderful, Scott, and thank you so much for having me. I know we've been at this for, what, six or seven months now, so I surrender, you've got me, here I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I try to be persistent. I've I've learned that that's you know a good uh, uh, tool in my life. So, and it must work because I've mentioned you to a couple of people, and they said, "Girl, go ahead and do it. He's not going to stop." <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should have been a, a private investigator. Or something, you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> wow. Well, I appreciate it, Cheryl, and the viewers and and uh, listeners will too. So, thank you. Thank you. Now. Um, your home, I assume. Uh, what area of the country are you in? I'm in Detroit, Detroit, Michigan. Mm -hmm. Well, that's born and the... raised. I've lived all over the place, but back home. Yeah. Yeah. So I can only imagine what it's like growing up in an area that is just so rich in music history. Uh, it just must flow out of everywhere. The pores of the of the city, right? Absolutely. Yeah. You see. You see your people, entertainers, and everybody everywhere from the time that you probably entered junior high school, because a lot of people started way back then. I remember doing um, shows at, in high school, you know, what they call back then sock hops and, and little concerts they used to do at school. You know, I used to hang out with you know, dramatics and different people like that, you know, because just bouncing around from school to school, doing shows and hanging out all over town, you know, all the nightclubs in town. Um, they weren't really big on barring you from getting in. So I've been hanging out in nightclubs since I was like 15, 16 years old. And there's everybody. You grow up with people, you hang out with them, you, you do all kinds of things with them. So, yeah, they become a, a natural, normal part of your life. Yeah. Yeah. I imagine it's kind of like I grew up in Los Angeles. So for like movie stars and things like that, it was kind of commonplace to just see them wherever, you know, I imagine like that with the musicians for Detroit. Absolutely. Well, I lived out there for eight years and worked in the movie industry. Oh, okay. Well, we'll get, we'll get to that. I, I got to hear about that. So um, what, uh, what was your life about before you connected at all with the P-Funk camp? <clears throat> uh, rather restricted. I grew up in a family that was that believed in going to school, getting a job, you know, getting a good job and working and being a good citizen and doing what you were supposed to do. And I found that the corporate world just wasn't for me. Um, I think right before... 
I jumped ship and decided I wanted to be in the entertainment business and learn the business, not the not be an entertainer, but learn the business. That was my interest. So before that, I was in corporate America, Ford Motor Company, research and engineering. And that was the most boring thing, the most, it was driving me crazy. So one day I left and I just never went back. And to this day, my family still thinks I have issues for doing that, but I've been happy. I'm not, I never regret it walking out that door and never walking back in again. So yeah, I came from corporate America. Yeah, very strict environment. Um, I came from a strict family. Uh, I only had one sibling and she's almost 10 years older than I am. So I basically grew up on my own being told, this is what you're going to do. This is what you need to do. This is how you're going to survive, you know, those kinds of things, those kinds of rules and regulations. And I just wasn't into rules and regulations. So um, I took off <laughs> and did my own thing. Was there anybody that you saw uh, do a concert in your early years, teens, early 20s, or as a young adult that just kind of blew your mind and you were like, wow, this is amazing? Sure. Before I came to P-Funk, I was on the road to Temptations for a while. Um, Dennis Edwards hired me. You know, I was just a, a gopher, but you got to start somewhere. And that didn't bother me. You know, I knew that I could always go back to corporate America if my life failed. I knew my brain would support that. I just never wanted to go back. So I was hanging out one night and got invited to his house with a gang of other people. And he started asking questions of everyone. And I, I talk a lot sometimes. I either talk a lot or I don't talk at all. And I was running my mouth over in the corner and he said, hey, you, the one talking. He says, what do you do? And I told him in so many words that I just bailed from corporate America. He said, can you drive? I says, oh, absolutely. I can drive my ass off. You know, so he says, I didn't ask you that. I asked if you could drive. And me being the flip person that I am, I said, my answer is still the same. I can drive my ass off. And I got hired that night as his driver and hit the road. He was one of the music. He was, well, not necessarily musicians. He was one of the entertainers that liked to have his vehicle with him when he got where he was going. So anywhere 700 miles, that was kind of like his, his space right there. Anything 700 miles from Detroit within that range, I drove. Other than that, it was planes. Yeah. So I started off driving for him. And how, running errands. How, how, how long? How long did that last? It didn't last very long. My health came into play, and I had to come home. I got a phone call from Detroit saying, "You need to come home because you have X, Y, Z. You have there's an, there's an issue." And I'm like, "You're full of it. I feel great. I'm you know doing my thing." And I hung up. And then the next day, I was called in and was told that my family had called Motown and I had to leave. So they had no choice but to send me home. It wasn't a decision that he or I could make after that point. So I had to come back home. So I guess I was out there maybe six months, maybe, you know. So that was my first introduction to the entertainment business and and the start of my learning to understand what happens on the road and that there are rules out there and being with Motown, they were strict rules out there. So that was a good beginning for me. During that time, did you, uh, you know, encounter Barry Gordy or anyone? Um, or no. The other temps uh, or anyone? Oh, yeah. I saw the, the temps all the time because I was standing in the wings while they were working. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. So I was with around them constantly all the time. Yeah. From one venue to the next, I was right there. Yeah. And they were great guys. You know, it wasn't I wasn't traumatized or, you know, it was like this new little kid out here. And let's see what we can do to harass her or whatever. No, they were they were gentlemen. They were really, really nice and helpful. Hmm. What, what year was that about? Mm, somewhere around 69, maybe somewhere around there. Yeah, 68, 69. 
I was really young. Then. Yeah, around two. Yeah, it's so like around the just my imagination type era. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm trying to think of where they were in their career. So yeah. Uh yeah, Dennis was doing Papa was Rolling Stone. You okay, know. I think that was. I thought, yeah, I think that was like 71, maybe. Was it all the way there? Okay, then go back a few years then. Yeah. Because in 71, I was in L.A. Okay. Yeah. So, all right. So you you had that brush with uh, mm. music and um, that whole scene. And then, you know, what happened, what transpired between that and, you know, encountering P-Funk? I knew P-Funk from New York. A girlfriend of mine was headed to New York to take care of some business. She used to say, you want to go? You know, she said, I got to meet these guys and she's going to handle her business and we we're going to come back home. The guys that she were, was going to meet was Parliament Funkadelic. And the person that she was meeting was Eddie Hazel. So and they were gigging at the Apollo. So we got to New York, went to the Apollo, met Eddie and met everybody, actually. Yeah, that's that's when I actually met everybody. Tiki, Eddie, um, Fuzzy, Grady, all of them were there. George, met George. Yeah. So going to Apollo, yeah, in the late 60s is when we met. So then they were just Funkadelic. It was before Parliament. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So they yeah. were very, very wild and rough around the edges at that point. Ooh, yes. <laughs> Mm, mm, mm. I'm like, where did they come from? Who are they? You know, but they were wonderful. They were so nice. You know, had I ever heard anything negative about them, I would have wondered where that came from because they were really, really genuinely nice guys. Yep, no muss, no fuss, no hassles. Yeah. And we hung out and party with them for a couple of days and came on back to Detroit, you know, exchange numbers, you know, and addresses and things like that so when they did land in detroit you know i was one of the people that they touch touch base with contacted so when you heard them play though did it kind of blow your mind like these guys are oh just out there? hell yes i'm like well, where is this music coming from who are they where are they coming from where is this music from never heard anything like it before so yeah it was a completely different groove started to change my whole attitude about music. You know, it's like, huh, there's some real music being made out here because I was so regimented to the Motown sound and what mm. was going on around Motown. Yeah, suddenly the boundaries were blown away. Oh, yes, yeah. yes. No rules, no nothing. It's just like, let's just be wild and make some hell of a music. <laughs> and that's what they were doing. <laughs> So about how much time would you say elapsed between that and when they came to Detroit and looked you up? Hmm, not very long. Say maybe within a year. Yeah, it didn't take long. Not at all. Not long at all. And when they came, you know, by then, we had made such wonderful friends, you know, in New York that, um, yeah, we just, we really started to hang out. You know, they were working in the studio. They came to hang out in the studio. We go down to the studio from time to time, you know, but that could bore me as well. Just sitting around the studio, you know, I'll hang out when the product is finished. But just hanging out, I wasn't one of those, you know, kind of folk at the time, you know. So they spent a lot of time hanging out at my place. I've always had, you know, houses and apartments and what have you. So, you know, there was always somebody in and out, always. And you were hanging at United, what is it, United Sound at that point? Yeah, United yeah. Sound. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they were uh, doing a lot of gigs at um, at a club called the 20 Grand as well. 20 Grand was real popular back in Detroit at that time. So they were doing a lot of gigs there. It was a local a local thing. Cheryl, what, would you, what was your early impression like of a couple of those guys like George? You know, what was your early impression of him? I thought maybe he was a little off, maybe a little crazy, you know. But I also understood that it probably takes crazy to be a genius at what you're doing. So, you know, and since it wasn't like I had all the sense in the world, <laughs> it was, you know, I was somebody interested in the bizarre and the crazy. 
So it, it worked out fine. It was like, oh, I found me some new people to hang out with. You know, they're crazy. I'm crazy. It's working. So, yeah. And they were, and like I said, they were, they were cool. There were just no hassles, no pressure, you know, because I wasn't hanging around looking to be with one of them, you know, so that made it easy for everybody as well. No pressure. You know, so I'm you, hanging. You were, you were chill and they were chill. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's, I guess that's a good way to put it. Yeah. You know, they understood that I was just somebody that was cool to hang around with. Yeah. I don't want anything from you, you know, not looking for anything. So I was my own person, didn't need anything from anybody. I was, I've always been very independent. So, yeah, so everything worked out great. Did it seem clear, though, that George was kind of the ringleader? And did he seem like he kind of had uh, creative, unorthodox kind of thought? Oh, very unorthodox. And, yeah, it was very evident that, you know, he was that guy. He was the one. You know, but he was always so quiet and laid back. You know, that was something that always kind of interested me in him and, you know, made me kind of sort of watch him because he was a quiet guy. He is a quiet guy. You know, he was not loud and boisterous and, you know, having to be seen, you know, and always having to be heard. You know, he was always in some kind of creative mode, you know thinking about the music, working on the music, yeah. putting the music together, putting people together with the music. Yeah, that was always his main frame. He was always working on the music. So who was maybe like chatty or kind of out there, Billy Bass or, you know, who? Yeah, he was a character. <laughs> yeah, Billy was a character. Um, who were the people that were really funny guys? Bernie Worrell, he was always funny. He was always had something stirred up. He was always, you know, playful and picking at people and doing stuff and playing tricks. And so, yeah, there was Bernie. There was Billy. Um, Fuzzy was a character. You know, he was live. Ray Davis, I really liked Ray. Yeah, something about Ray. He was he had his quiet side, but he's really, really a good guy. Always a good vibe. Always. So, you know, you pick your people to, you know, to talk to, to hang around with. And, you know, Ray was around. We, he was around a lot. He used to hang out at, in one of, one of the houses that I had a lot. You know, it was always a pleasure to have him around. So when you started mingling with, with the guys, were there any uh, girls yet in, in the group for the backgrounds or they hadn't come yet? They hadn't come yet. No, for the most part, I was just hanging out with the guys, girlfriends and wives because I got along with them. Yeah. Like I said, I wasn't after your man. I uh, did, didn't need that. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't need any problems in my life. I was single and independent and happy. <laughs> so if that's yours, good for you. I'm happy for you. So, yeah, basically just the wives and girlfriends were around. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. one of them is in town right now. I got to get to her before she leaves. Yeah. Um, so how did your involvement progress? Uh, George knew that I had been on the road with the temptations, you know, just from me bouncing back and forth in and out of the studio. You know, I always had a vehicle. I've always had cars all of my life. So when I was 16 years old, got a car, never been without a vehicle since. And, you know, they, you know, you're living in a strange town. You don't have any cars. You don't have a way to do anything. So, you know, so I was always there, you know, shuttling the guys around, you know, going here, going there, getting them back and forth to the studio or to a gig or something. So just from hanging around, having conversation, he knew, you know, that I had been out on the road and he knew that I was back from the road. Um, my problems were over and I was just kind of like hanging around, bored, you know, telling myself, God, please don't send me back to corporate America, you know, find something for me to do. And George was in the making of in his brain, you know, he was putting together that that female thing. You know, they had been out in L.A. for a while. So he was trying to get that together. And once he got that together in his head, he asked me if I'd like to go out on the road with the with the girls. And I was like, yeah, no doubt. You know, <laughs> corporate world be damned. You know, so I was all over that, you know, when he decided 
And eventually he sent me out on the road to train before the girls were ready to go out. And that's kind of how it all worked out. Yeah, he knew that I had been out there. He knew I was familiar with the road because I had gone out with who I was with, you know, and he knew things were were, like I said, rigid, and there was order, and it was organized, so, and I had always been that. George had never seen me scatterbrained or, you know, just doing tripped out stuff, you know. As far as they were concerned, my shit was together. Like I said, I always had my own place, own vehicles, own, my own money. I was never hanging around trying to spend somebody's money or anything like that, so not that there was any to spend, but that none of those things were in my playbook. So who was the first you met? Was it Malia or who do you think was maybe the first ones? Mm -mm, the first female I think I met. Yeah, it was Deb. It was Debbie. Yeah. Debbie she, yeah. Yeah. Because she was the first female that they pulled in. Yeah. So, yeah, Debbie was the first one. Yeah. And then Malia. Mm -hmm. and, so, then, and then Jeanette. And and you along the way you actually got a couple of background vocal credits. You know what happened? How did you you just were around and they pulled you in or what? Yeah, well, I I could sing, you know, <laughs> but that like I said, that was not my motivation. That was not my mo. I I didn't show up because I wanted somebody to make me a star or because I wanted to sing really bad. But my thing was, shit, I can sing. Can I get some of this little extra money? That was my motivation. So um, when they were putting everything together and the girls knew, you know, that I could sing a little bit. And Malia, somebody recently referred to her as the architect. And I think that is a perfect word for her because she brought so many people on board. She found so many people, you know. So I don't know if it was Mal. It had to have been her. They said, hey, you know, she can sing. And there it goes. Background, I went. <laughs> Just in the studio, had no desire to be on stage trying to do anything. You know, the, all of that is just too, it's too much for me. You know, I just want to want to be part of an organization and be in the background. I'm a background person. I'm which just, which, which, which tracks are you on for the folks watching? Mm -hmm. You don't remember? <laughs> <laughs> When it comes to Parlette, I did almost all of their things on, on almost all of their almost all of their stuff. Yeah, I sang on almost all of their stuff. Yeah, okay. and a couple of things for the brides. Yeah, see how I said mm -hmm. I, <laughs> I was just singing, making extra money. I just was not trying to be a star. You know, a lot of people have never seen me, don't know me, because I was just one of those people that was just never trying to be up front or be out there, you know, trying to be known. I, that wasn't my fantasy. Yeah. Well, you were literally part of the, um, the funk mob, the P funk army. Um, what, um, what was it like for those, most of us never around in the studio when P funk was in studio doing their thing, how would you describe that scene? When you were hanging around. <laughs> it all depends on who was in the studio, who was working, what they were working on, what kind of condition everybody was in. Because sometimes it was just a wild ass party in the studio. And other times it was quiet and serious because something serious was being cut or sang or whatever. But sometimes it could be real chaotic. It just it it de depended on, on, on the day and the person. Um Things go wrong in life. So if somebody's not happy, they might disrupt a whole session. And, you know, after the conflict, you know, the cursing or the, you know, or I'm going to do this to you or I'm going to do that to you. You know, after th everything calms down and boils down, it's back to business. But it could become very chaotic because you have to understand there's so many people that do want to get at you because of who you are. So, you know, and the guys would bring females to the studio sometimes and those females didn't understand their position or they didn't understand that the guy might have somebody there already. And they didn't know to just sit and be comfortable and be quiet, you know, as opposed to 
wanting to hang all over the guy or, you know, pretend that they belong to the guy, you know. So you always have female conflicts from time to time going on. Yeah, all depending on the mood and the day and the time and, the, and yeah, just what was going on. You know, there was always people getting high. So all depending on the extent of your getting high, you know, a lot of things came into play. You know, was when it you're... T typically all hours too, uh, overnight? Oh, yeah. yeah. We came out of the studio a lot of mornings blinded by the sun. Yeah, it's like, oh, my God, we've been in here for 12 hours. Oh, yeah, sometimes it's absolutely spent the night in studios. Um there was a studio on the east side. I can't remember the name of it. It wasn't in Detroit. It was in East Point or somewhere like that. I spent a lot of time in that studio and spent a lot of nights in that studio. But um, that was the way it went with them. Yeah, sometimes you just spent the night in the studio waiting for your turn to get to the mic. Mm -hmm. You know, go to sleep, wake up or go to sleep, get high, wake up, waiting for your turn. You know, sometimes when putting backgrounds on, on, on a lot of things, George sometimes didn't use instruments. He used us. You know, hand claps come across a microphone, you know, in, in, in a variety of different ways and sounds. And sometimes we would spend an hour or two standing in a microphone, a gang of us, just clapping as hard as you could, you know over and over and over till your hands were red, till your hands were hurting. But once you heard that mixed in a song and played back, it's like, damn, you know? So yeah, George was an extraordinary, he is an extraordinary guy. And some of the shit he came up with was just amazing. Mm. Absolutely amazing. I'm, I'm guessing that uh, having been on some of that and then hearing the finished product on the radio eventually Amazing. probably surprised you sometimes, right? Absolutely. Sometimes we'd be riding down the street and one of the tunes would come on the radio. You know, and we'd be in the car singing and bouncing and having a good time. And it's like, damn, listen to so-and-so or listen to this or listen to that. Yeah. Yeah. It was about mm -hmm. that music. Um, I mean, you, I don't think you know about me, but I get exposed to it for the first time with Mothership Connection. Um, it's one of the first records I ever bought on my own when I was junior high age. <laughs> okay. And uh, I was hooked. I mean, totally hooked from that point on. Yeah. Got everything before it, everything after it, the yeah. day it came out. Could not get enough of the funk. You the know? music it was like a drug. It's like a drug. Yeah. It really, really is. You know, there are generations of people listening to that music now. Absolutely generations. You know, people are still raising babies <laughs> to be funk. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's never been. I mean, many have tried, but it's yeah. never been completely replicated. Maybe for like a flash here or there. But exactly. nothing like the, I mean, it's, it's just nothing in the history of music, really. No, no. Um. Well, the musicians were outstanding as well. You know, people have a tendency to look at musicians like, eh, and they picked up a drum and they learned how to play or picked up, you know, their acts and taught himself how to play or, ah, oh, he learned in the high school band. You know, no, these guys were exceptional. You know, when you have Boston Conservatory of Music and Juilliard School, I mean, you know, real music, you know, you be on the bus, the tour bus going down the highway, and there's Bernie sitting there with napkins spread out on the table. And he's literally writing music. He's putting notes on a napkin, you know, getting getting tunes ready. You know, groups don't do that. They didn't do that. It takes an exceptional bunch of guys to do that. And a, and a masterful ringleader. Absolutely. Um, yes. Yeah. Yes. What what year was it when you kind of became employed by the organization? 1970, late 77 or early 78. Okay. So, yeah, I think Parlet's first record was 77, I want to say, and Bride's first in 78. Um, what, um, what were you tasked with doing? you know, related to those acts? 
making sure that the girls were taken care of on the road. Road managers, I used to refer to it as glorified babysitter. Because kind of sort of in essence, that's what you're doing. Um, you're also responsible for getting, because they had a hell of a band too. Parlette put a band together that was amazing. Bunch of young guys, young guys, and they were killers. So, you know, you're responsible for getting everybody from point A to point B safely. Responsible for getting them into the gig. The only thing, one of the things that used to frustrate the hell out of me, we'd get to a gig you know, getting everybody up, you know, get up, wake up, whatever. We're at the gig, you know, let's let's go in and find out where our dressing rooms are, find out where this is, find out where the food is. You know, I had to make contact with certain people involved in the arena or the auditorium or wherever the hell we were playing. And I would get everybody up, get everybody off the bus, get them lined up. Get them, everybody's marched into the facility, into the venue, wherever we're playing. And I was always the last one to make sure I had everybody. And as soon as I got ready to walk in the door, an arm would cross the door saying, where are you going? Excuse me, asshole. They're here because I got them here. Now, if you don't let me in, there won't be a show. And I bet you you don't do any more gigs. So, you know, having to fight my way in, that used to really tick me off. <laughs> so I got to the point where when the bus would pull up at a venue, I would go in first and make my contacts and let everybody know I got the group outside. You know, I had to do it that way. I had to reverse my the way I was approaching things. Because Did you have a lanyard? No, not before we got to the gig. Hmm. Yeah, don't forget, they were new out the gate. They weren't, you know, old funk people that had stuff already. No, you got that stuff when you got to the gig. So, yeah, and sometimes that didn't matter because sometimes people wearing those didn't matter. They were girlfriends or groupies or the guy sneaking somebody in, you know. So, no, like I said, sometimes I had to fight my way in. So I learned to curse my way through doors from time to time. And once you get in, you get everybody situated, get them set up. You know, this is where you'll be. This is where you'll be. Sometimes everybody was together in the same room because depending on where you were working, uh, facilities weren't separate enough for the ladies to be here and the guys to be there. So everybody got used to dressing in front of each other and doing everything. You know, your family on the road. So get with the program, you know, get out of that crap and get in this, you know, <laughs> we got work to do. So, yeah, you're responsible for the group. Uh, time is a factor. You know, you're responsible for getting them to the stage on time, getting them off the stage on time. Um, hotels, checking them in at hotels, you know, go get the keys. Everybody stays on the bus. So it's not to frighten everybody in the hotel lobby. So everybody stay on the bus. Let me go get the keys, you know, come back with the keys, pass them out, you know. And sometimes we get to certain venues, depending on where we were in America. And uh, we just weren't welcome. So what if it's already paid for? We don't want you here. Oh, but we have nowhere else to go. And this is paid for. So that's sometimes I had to go back out to the bus and say, OK, everybody, this hotel is going to be a problem for us. So we need to get our boom boxes and we need to go sit in the lobby and we need to play music until they understand that we're not going anywhere because we don't have anywhere to go and we're not sleeping on the bus. So sometimes that worked. I shouldn't say sometimes. Most times that worked. Yeah. You know, you got people coming, checking into a hotel and they see a bunch of crazy ass looking people in the lobby with P-Funk music blasting. Hotel has to do something quickly. So it's like, get to those rooms now. <laughs> so, yeah, there's always something going on. Never a dull moment. You know, I've checked out of hotels and and depending on what part of America we were in. Um, there were great big old policemen standing there with their hands on their guns, like we were going to run out and not pay the bill. You know, and I would look at them and ask them, may I help you? You know, now we're just making sure you're going to do the right thing. We always do the right thing. Could you move over so I can take care of my business so we can get the hell out of here? So, yeah. Yeah. 
Cheryl, did you have all of those qualities you think as part of your makeup or did you evolve a little bit into the role? No, um, that was basically part of my makeup. My mother was a beast. <laughs> she didn't play. <laughs> so I kind of grew up, like I said, you know, independent and knowing who I was and that I wasn't going to take any crap. Yeah, my mother was a beast. She was a short woman um, that knew who she was. She worked hard, made uh, her money. My parents made good money and uh, they didn't take any crap. They taught me to not take crap. You don't have to. If you know who you are, you know what you're doing. If you're qualified for what you're doing, don't take any crap. Mm-hmm. Now, who was your counterpart on the Parliament Funkadelic side? Was it Archie Ivy or somebody else? Or when you say my counterpart, meaning who was like supposed the, to who was supposed to be my peer? Well, like the road manager on the Funkadelic and Parliament side. Was there somebody in your role on that side? When I first went out there, you know, I was so busy doing my job, I can't even recall who was road managing at the point. I know, um, yes, I do. Johnny Parent. Hmm. Yep, Johnny Parent. Take that back. That's who was out there when I came out there. Because eventually I took his place when I left the girls because George gave me the guys on one of the tours. Yeah. And Johnny Parent left the road and I stayed and I came with the guys and worked great with the guys. You know, I was I was at the first bride show at the Starwood in Hollywood, California, which was like still probably been hundreds of concerts, and that may be the best one. Okay. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> that was an unforgettable experience for sure. Yeah. Were, were right. you were you in the house at that? No. Okay. No, I wasn't there. I was. Where was I? I was probably somewhere with um with the uh, with Parlette because mm-hmm. I hung out with them as long as I could. Yeah. So uh, Don's book, um, you know, you're in that book quite a bit. Um, what do you think of the book? I haven't. I held it for the first time maybe 10 days ago. And uh, I wasn't in a position where I could, you know, I just kind of like thumb through it, you know. Um, so some of the pictures were absolutely awesome. We had some great pictures in there. Um, but I haven't had a chance to to eyeball it, the language or or anything like that. But yeah, I'm I'm super supportive of her writing her book, and I'm glad she's having a great turnout with her book. And I wish her much much success with her book. Yeah, yeah, it's been a great uh, addition to the lore, you know. And mm-hmm. I, I think you'll be happy with how you're portrayed in it. So okay. um, yeah, okay. I think it's all favorable. But um, oh, nothing's ever all favorable with me, <laughs> and that's part of why I love me. Part of your charm, yes. <laughs> um, but you know, one of the key things in this, she she talks about um, sort of the systematic undermining of and sabotaging of like the girl groups, and that that happened within the organization. They had to sneak out at interviews and things like that. Can you shed any light? on your perspective of, of that? I'm, I don't, I can't use the word sneak because I never snuck them anywhere to do an interview. There may have been times when I had to fight, you know, for interviews for them because somebody didn't think it was necessary or, you know, or they wanted to be there to monitor what was being said. And I'm like, no, you don't. We're grown, you know? So there were times when I may have, set up an interview that nobody knew about, but I don't call that sneaking. I call that setting up an interview. (laughs) So yeah. Other than that. Yeah. A lot of interviews and some of them weren't approved of. Yeah. What you going to do? They needed press just like everybody else. So, and I was 100% for the girls. So whatever had to be done out there for the girls, it got done if I could do it. You know, I went in my own pocket many times, you know, to buy things for the women, you know, because I was told, you know, there was no money or, you know, no, they don't need that. You know, so I screw you, you know, so I'd go get it. Yeah. You know, my thing is, you ain't the boss of me. It's hard working with men, especially on the road. Everybody knows it's not easy for women on the road. It's hard. And when men do not have your back in any way, shape or form, 
You just fight a little harder. That's all. Especially back then, right? It hasn't absolutely. Got, yeah. Absolutely. Back then, it was just like it was treacherous. It was, ooh, yeah. You know, sometimes you, you go somewhere by yourself at night and, and, and you cry to get that frustration out of you, you know, so you don't wake up the next day and go find somebody and kill them, you know. So you, you, you have to protect yourself in, in, in many ways, you know, found that out. You know, that's why a lot of people get strung out. That's why a lot of people can't cut it. It's hard. It's hard. Yeah. But I refuse to just die. I just just refuse, you know, I will fight back. Yeah. You know, I, I watched how, for example, like uh, Prince, uh, a few years later, he created the time and the time started to do shows where they were kind of taking the limelight away from him. Yeah. And so he kind of suppressed the time. That's right. People don't like that. Mm -mm, so is George. that kind of a little bit of what happened with? Yep. George got mad at the girls sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he even made statements to the press from time to time about not letting any little girls show him up, you know, because like I said, their band was fierce. Oh, they were awesome. And me, if it comes up, it comes out. And some nights, Parlette's band, Parlette would be on the stage and they would be killing. And I would run back to the dressing room and tell the fellas, <laughs> you better kick it tonight because they are kicking your ass out there. You know, so I, I know they didn't take too kindly to that, but the truth is the truth. I can't help myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, some nights, yeah, they just beat the crap out of P-Funk. P-Funk had to come out and work. That's a good thing. It's got to hey, it's friendly it was, competition. It was you know? a wonderful thing to me. I was like, oh, look at them. They are kicking your ass out there. Go listen, go listen. Sometimes the fellows would. They just couldn't take it anymore, and they'd have to go stand in the wings and watch. And say, damn, themselves, they had to give them props. Yeah, you get props when they do. Give props. Grow up. Do your thing. Yeah. I always wondered why, you know, Parlette didn't make more appearances in Los Angeles where I grew up. You know, they were maybe like on one, at most two funk fests, and then that was about it. Yeah, no, things were kind of going crazy in the background with them. And, and some things I'm not going to talk about because when the book comes out next year, all the answers are in the book. You know, Seth Neblett wrote a book. And uh, he interviewed everybody, it seems. Everybody that came in contact with that group. You know, from, from engineers to producers to promoters to hangers-on. You name it. He interviewed them. Yeah. So when that book hits, everybody's answers, <laughs> everybody's questions should be answered for real. <laughs> yeah, I I look for I've been hearing about it for so long. So I know, I know, I know. When they say it takes a long time to really do a book and do it well, it takes a long time. And he's been and 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 it took so long because he wanted to interview everybody. He didn't want to do this third person. He didn't he didn't want to talk to somebody and then try to remember and put it down. He recorded every voice in that book. So that's the kind of interviewing that he did. So there would be no discrepancies. No, I didn't say that. Oh, yes, you did. It's on tape. You know, so, yeah, it, it, the book's going to be amazing. Yeah, because these are the people's actual words. These are everybody's truths, as I say. Whatever your truth was or is, that's what's in the book. Because like I said, he sat and he interviewed everybody for the book. He didn't just take somebody else's word for something. I believe the title is uh, Mothership Connected, the Women of Parliament Funkadelic. So yes. hopefully, I know the title changed at some point too, but I think Yeah, the working, the working title was, oh, it went away as soon as I was getting ready to say it. Yeah, there was a different working title. Damn it. The, the, the Girls Are Bad or something like that. Yeah, The Girl Is Bad. Thank you. Yeah. See, you know everything. The Girl <laughs> Is Bad. That was the working title. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. yeah, over and over and over as he wrote and- called and read to me and then we would hook up i'd go out there he'd come to detroit and we would read and read and read so yeah so like i said these are people's truths that they had to say about different aspects of 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 that life of the whole parliament funkadelic world 
Yeah, I'll definitely have him on once that finally comes out. Looking forward yeah. to that. This yeah, this is a toast, a toast to his mother. That's what this is all about. Yeah, because Malia, she was, she was, well, she was crazy as hell. That's my girl, my pal Mal. That's what I called her all the <laughs> time, my pal Mal. Because <laughs> when she was on the road, sometimes I had Seth with me because he was a kid. He was a child then. He was really, you know, a, a kid. So sometimes she would go off and do her thing with another group or somebody else, and Seth would be with me. We'd hang out. Yeah, so he and I became super, super, super close. So you're like Auntie Cheryl? Yeah, I've been mama, auntie, you know, yeah, all of that. Yeah, yeah. he's been son, nephew. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's much more to this great Truth and Rhythm interview. Just continue on to the next part of the episode. Also, be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends. And become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinslift.net. Thank you very much.